knowledge. He's had a lot of years there. And Chuck isn't one to call uh, with an alarming issue if it needs attention. If he has something that's worth their attention, then he contacts and time's not wasted. He knows his way around the hill. He knows the people that are important to issues. And so I have asked Chuck this morning just a few minutes ago, and I hope he's ready. Uh, if he'd like to give just a, a legislative report here to the convention body on activity there in behalf of this organization. I know, as you do, that the thrust, the success or failure of our programs will be determined by us as we till the soil and become involved in producing. But it's also important as a secondary thrust that we do watch become involved in and influence the legislation that will affect us as farmers and ranchers. I don't look for anything to come from there that will guarantee us cost of production, 90 or 100 percent of parity. I don't see those things coming from that source, and those who are honest with you will tell you that they cannot, in their position, guarantee you and I an adequate source of income equaling our cost of production. And so we do have our homework to do, but we must also be involved in those secondary issues that have such an effect on the programs and policies that we, because of being in agriculture and working with the Department of Agriculture, will be involved in. So Chuck, would you come and take that time, please? Good morning. It's nice to be back and see you in Kansas City again. It's especially nice that we could have this warm Washington weather to start the week off. We'll, we'll go with a pleasant attitude until the storm gets here and it changes, right? Devon was very kind in introducing me, and I feel rather humble in coming before you each year in the convention. And undertaking to summarize or wrap up what we do in Washington or what is going on there in just a matter of a few minutes, but let me try it this way with you today. For those of you who were in the last convention, I'm not particularly proud of the accuracy or the outcome, but I think I did talk to you some then about interest rates, where we were going in farming in this country, and some concern about uncertainty in our markets. As I come out to see you again this year, some of the recent announcements tend to rather confirm or at least parallel what we were talking about a year ago. Namely, we've got prime interest rates above 15 percent. We've got rates out here in the country that are going in the 16 to 18 range. We have been promised now by the economists that net farm income next year will drop 20 percent or thereabouts. And it's always been my experience in dealing with them back there in Washington when they predict 20 percent, you can count on it being at least that much. I'm sure I don't need to say that to you, but it is probably a conservative estimate. So if I were going to try to, quote, report on Washington to you at this time, it's only appropriate to point out, of course, that the whole top of our government, everyone in Washington with any brains and responsibility, so to speak, are concerned about settling the Iranian affair. And tied up closely with it is the matter of energy, and there follows then the inevitable problem on inflation, which in turn introduces us to tight money and high interest rates. 
I think we have to look forward to a few months at least of short money, high interest rates, and a real challenge to get this 1980 farming season underway with some hope of being able to pay for it next fall. That's not particularly a rosy, happy kind of a statement, and I don't bring it to you with any pleasure. But it is the feeling of a number of us who have been involved with the national scene back there for several years. If that's right, in other words, if those are the circumstances we face in 1980, then I think it's perfectly obvious that it's going to be a challenging year in the NFO. It's going to be a time when you will have an opportunity to go ahead and expand the movement on milk and grain and some of the livestock. It's going to be a time when government farm programs are not going to be adequate from an income standpoint. It's going to be a time when people who are associated with other forms of marketing are going to be looking for an alternative. If we're standing ready to move these commodities and get the members paid quickly, we probably will have a chance to advance bargaining in 1980. And that would be entirely compatible with the type of farm program and the type of political situation that's shaping up back in Washington right now. To review with you in a little detail, those of you who follow commodity programs, we did get the milk bill through the Congress. It has been signed. The 80% minimum support on milk is now assured for the next two years so that dairymen have the safety net established. And thankfully, milk prices are running a little above that level anyway. In grain, the little 7% bill that went through the House with men like Congressman English, Dan Glickman, others pushing hard on it. In the Senate side, they are probably going to bring to the floor today a little Senate waiver on the budget that has already been passed so that they may then pass the bill that we got out of the Senate Agriculture Committee only about a week ago. It would raise target prices on grain 7% for 1980. It would only be 363 on wheat and 235 on corn. It isn't any record breaker. But when we think of farm program provisions as price insurance, or we'll say the, the bottom of the swing when we're in trouble, at least I think we are going to get that bill through the Congress and we will have some improvement in the minimum support made available for next year. There are a number of little bills back there that will be of interest to some of you. The Family Farm Antitrust Act had good hearings on the Senate side and a member of the House Agriculture Committee that's supported by our people in his home state of Wisconsin is going to try to have a hearing on that bill real soon. The bargaining bill about which we are all concerned is slowed up some for the time being, but it is a matter you should continue to discuss with your members of Congress and the Senators. The field hearings that were tentatively announced a couple of months ago were canceled. Some of our sister organizations probably will ask for hearings again after the first of the year. Ms. Bornstein, in my office, whom a number of you have met, and I have been in touch with the people who are in charge of that bill in the House. We've asked them to lay off the hearings, and we've asked them to forget about the bill. We're getting along just fairly well at it. 
In other words, it's one that I don't think you have to worry about next week or next month, but you can't afford to forget it. I'm sure you've read the reporter. I'm sure you know the bill I'm talking about. It would be that bargaining bill which would set up the government to supervise, investigate, and otherwise take charge of all bargaining on farm commodities. It's the sort of thing that we do not need. And I hope you will remember to talk to your congressman about it. Don't go to sleep. Don't forget it, please. In another field, namely disaster program provisions of the farm program, the FMHA disaster loans have been costing the government something between five and six hundred million dollars a year recently. Between the administration and the Congress, they've had a running thing going now for about a year to develop an all-purpose crop insurance program covering 16 of the biggest crops in the country and offering farmers insurance at three different coverage levels. The coverage level at 50% of yield would be subsidized under this proposed new crop insurance program to make it a rather acceptable kind of insurance, especially for those of you in areas where you occasionally suffer from drought or flood. Now, I mention this one because just as sure as the world, most of us will be, hopefully, lucky enough to go through 1980 without a drought or without a disaster. But it's a big country, and almost every year, We'll have some areas of 10, 20, 30, 40 counties that really get busted with a drought. And at the current rate of operation, that's an expensive proposition. Some people go under before they get out of it. So some of us have been working hard with the Congress to try to be sure that that crop insurance program will be improved substantially over the old program that's available out here in the country today if they're going to pass it and make it law. Because if they pass that bill, then they will knock off the FMHA disaster loans and the farm program disaster coverage, and it will, we will be back to a position where we were a number of years ago of having to buy our own insurance against drought, flood, and similar disasters. So I know you're not all interested. For that reason, I'm not going to go into any detail. But I assure you, if you're farming and grain in areas where you've got a little risk on weather, you'd ought to follow this, and you'd ought to talk to your member of Congress about it. It's a very controversial proposition back in the Congress. The insurance industry has one set of viewpoints. Two of our sister agencies who write insurance policies have their viewpoints. And then there are the rest of us who do not sell insurance, mind you, but who have to buy it. We have our viewpoint. I think that will come to a head in the Congress January, February period. They've had the hearings this year. The politicking and the lobbying has been going hot and heavy for six or eight months. And early next year, you probably will see some action on it. We had one little victory. Some people wanted to take away from the Secretary of Agriculture the responsibility to make a recommendation on any proposal to embargo the export of cattle hides. A number of your senators and congressmen were in, interested in this one. And although you don't like to fight some of your friends, we did whip some of the labor union people, the shoe industry and the leather industry. And the deal failed in the Congress. They still cannot embargo 
export shipments on cattle hides without running it through the Secretary of Agriculture for a recommendation. And regardless of whether you think Bob Berglund does everything perfectly, at least uh, he's a friend, we can talk to him, we get a fair shot at the target if it goes through that Department of Agriculture, and that's the way we're it's the way we like it, if we have to put up with questions like this. In the energy field, there are some new appropriations. There are some new authorities. There will be some more grant and loan money available for local application. Now, I couldn't possibly stand up here and analyze the bills for you. There must be a hundred different bills in the Congress in the whole energy field. But I know that the principal interest for many of you centers quickly on what can be done either on the farm or at the local development level, the small town, small plant level. It's this type of program that we have been supporting out of our office. We figured the big boys will be in to take care of their end of it. We've just been trying to keep even with ours. And, and we are having some success. There will be some additional authority and there will be some money for both biomass and alcohol development. President Woodland, I could stand up here and rattle on about many of these things, but uh, I'm reminded of a very short little old joke. Someone quoted it recently. They said, he who indulges generally bulges. So I don't want to overdo it. It's nice to see you this morning. Be around here for the next couple of days. We've got a couple or three good speakers coming in to you. We've got a great year coming up in 1980. I have no doubt about what the course of the fate of the nation will be changed many, many times before you get through these precinct caucuses and primaries and get through listening to it all. I just wish to God they hadn't started so early. You can't imagine how many phone calls we get and how many people that just think we'd ought to give them a little touch of advice or other form of assistance back there. Our good friends over in the in RECA, I see Gene Porter from Kansas sitting down here. I, I know he's a busy man and looks forward to an active season. I mention all this to tell you again in plain English, in our small office back in Washington, we realize very, very well that politics and farm programs and dependence on government assistance are all secondary to the bargaining program that we operate in this organization. We try never to forget it back there. But on the other hand, I want to ask you to remember one with me, too. There are 435 members in the House. There are 100 senators. There are thousands of people in government. Some of you do call us to go into those offices by telephone and otherwise and learn something for you. We try to keep up with it all, and we need some support and some help out here in the country. Just remember, when we put a story in the reporter about one of these issues that's up before the Congress back there, we're not trying to entertain you. We hope you read it with some interest, and if you've got an NFO viewpoint, pick up your pen, write to your member of Congress, let your senator know how you feel. They're very impressed when they hear from you out here in the country. There are other ways to be effective in politics back there, and we'll perhaps be talking about those some more before this convention is finished. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your help. I hope you do follow these issues, because if that's our responsibility back there, we can only do it with some help from you.
And I'll guarantee you, I don't care whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, or a Mugwump. Call me, talk to me, let me know what you are and what you can do. I'll politic with you on either side of the street any hour of the day or night, but I can't do a damn thing if you don't talk to me. Thank you so much, folks. minutes that you need. Thank you, Delvon. Delegates, National Board of Directors, guests. On December the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of this month, I did attend a Gatha Hall convention in San Antonio, Texas in behalf of your organization, the National Farms Organization, with the purpose of gathering as much information for the membership as possible. It was a well-attended convention from the major portions of the United States, from California, New York, Texas, to Minnesota. It was an enthusiastic crowd uh, and it was well staffed and it was well planned. Uh, the shop, the lectures, uh, the boots that they had were very informal and informational. There were representatives of all types of manufacturing firms you can imagine. Uh, there were personnel from universities, uh, there were personnel from different organizations, commissions, and so forth at this meeting. I would say that the foremost thing that we need to think about here today is in the next few months ahead, uh, there will be a tremendous surge forward in the promotion of alcohol production from grain products and from cellulose materials, and of the latter, of course, will hold the greatest potentials, and I feel, and of course it was reported there at the convention, others felt that there would be a breakthrough in the near future with enzymes that would work, that could break down your corn stalks and your sunflower stalks and uh, straw and so forth, convert into starch and uh, distill alcohol out of those products. One might remember at a convention of this kind that there were all types of schemers there also. I chuckled to myself as I walked around and seen all those guys with stars in their eyes with their hands ready to get in your and my pocket as farmers. We've had those experiences in the past and I guess it's going to continue. It kind of reminded me of uh, when I was a child uh, remember how we used to go on an ant hill and poke a uh, stick and make the ants come out, maybe throw a little sugar or candy, and they'd all scurry over each other to get at that sugar. Well, that's the way it reminded me of some of those promoters trying to get at the farmer to promote something at that time. However, along with all of that fan and fury going on, it was a very constructive meeting, and I think we need to take it very seriously where we're going to go as independent farmers in the future. Now, to build a alcohol still for fuel is not a complicated uh, situation. It's relatively simple. Uh, it just simply is uh, setting up a grinder. We're, we're talking of cereal grain. We're talking of a grinder or a roller that would crush or grind the grain, put into a cooker and cooked, cool with yeast added, go into 48 hours of fermentation, and then distillation uh, for step number one in the distillation process. I'm going to talk, I'm going to call step one and step two in the distillation process so that uh, we may understand a little better of what we're faced if we do have any idea 
as producers to go into it. In uh, the first step, in step number one, you will distill alcohol to about anywhere from 150 to 170, and even as high as 180 proof. Now, out of each gallon of fuel, or out of each gallon of grain, for example, corn, barley, or whatever grain you might use, wheat, they're all uh, can be used for the production of alcohol, you will get at least a third of that bushel into alcohol at its top stage, which would be 196 plus to 200 proof. However, in step one, at the lower level from 150 to 180 proof, you would get as much as three gallons plus. And this, of course, can be burnt directly in a high compression engine, a gas engine today with simple modifications. So it's no big deal as far as trying to convert your present gas equipment to burning straight alcohol is relatively simple. And of course, with the kits being made on the market today, it's going to be just in a very short time as common for you to burn straight alcohol in your machines and your gas engines as it is to burn gasoline. I want you to keep that in mind as we discuss uh, what the possibilities are. You can at the present time reduce your diesel engines, those that uh, you would put a supercharger on, whether it be over the road diesels hauling your, your tandems or whether, and your semis or whether it be your uh, farm diesel tractors. There are kits already manufactured by companies that will directly inject 50-50, 50% water and 50% alcohol directly into your intake system, which would reduce your diesel fuel by 20%, replacing it with water and alcohol. For example, if you have a 125 horsepower diesel tractor, that would burn eight and a half gallons of fuel, uh, it would reduce the fuel, the fossil fuel, down to uh, six gallons, and you would replace the other, and the efficiency by a half a gallon, and you'd replace the rest of it by one gallon of water and one gallon of alcohol. These are things that can be done immediately. Now, my concern is this. And I think we, and I was talking to Vaughn about it, uh, he's a little concerned that I might uh, oversell an idea here to you so you get the idea you're going into a gas haul business rather than collective bargaining. We don't, in the wildest stretch of imagination, want to deviate away from collective bargaining because that's the answer, regardless of what anyone tells you. However, I see an opportunity here that if we miss it, we will simply fall back into the hands with our alcohol production just in, uh, as the fuel industry is taking control of the gas industry. The same thing will happen in the gas oil industry. It's going to be here to stay, fellows. I'm persuaded of that one thing. But it's what you and I do with it starting very soon is what's going to happen whether you and I as independent farmers are going to become self-energy dependent. In other words, independent fuel producers. This would take roughly about 5% of your crop at the present time. This means for heating your home, uh, running your tractors, and your equipment. Now, the reason I mentioned that you need to think very carefully before you anticipate the idea of going to gas haul production. It's a whole different ballgame. If you're going to produce alcohol to be used in gasoline, then you must 
evaporate or distill that to 196 plus or 200 proof. That takes second stage distilling and that becomes very costly, uh, consume a lot of energy, but the industry will not put any less proof alcohol than 196 plus into gasoline to keep it a trouble-free commodity to sell to the, to the public out there. Now, I'm not concerned as a farmer here today of producing fuel for snowcats and recreation vehicles and all of those things. That's the least of my concern. I think the American public are going to have to discipline themselves. They're going to have to change their standard of living down the line if they're not going to do it willingly. It's going to be legislated on them. That I'm persuaded of. But my concern is here that we as the producers of raw material can become energy independent by simply establishing another step in our operation that we would put a simple form of distillation alcohol operation on our farm just like we would buy a combine, a tractor, or any other unit and build it and plant it into our operation so that it is a good, solid economic unit because it can be done that way and you would become independent as far as fuel is concerned, energy is concerned, and to produce down the road. There are moves, I don't know if Devon mentioned to you or not, but when he did meet with the president, the president was concerned. They had legislated and have legislated on the automobile industry to become more efficient on fuel. However, he said that they had not at this time really put restrictions on farmers to become more efficient, but I can see down the road. I'm just saying I can see down the road that someday you're going to be allocated fuel and told what crops you're going to produce or what crops you're going to get fuel to produce and they're going to control your production. So you need to think very carefully at this crossroad in history. When you have an opportunity, as never before, to become independent like no one's ever become independent, where you can determine your destiny simply by making a simple choice now and a well-planned choice in the future. As I said earlier, the first stage of distillation is simple. For you people who are dairy cattle, you have a ready-made deal. Because the cost of the second stage distillation, for example, and what you do with the wet mesh is a very uh, thought-provoking idea. Say, for example, you are a grain farmer and say, hey, I'm going to go out there and just turn my whole crop, cereal crop, into alcohol and, uh, and sell my crop that way. I think if you have that in your mind, you better do a lot of studying. I think you're going to miss the boat. Because number one, you'd have to find a place to dispose of your wet mesh or dry it, which is going to be tremendously energy consuming to dry it. Uh, so rather I would like you to think in this line, in this term, of only producing enough for yourself or maybe a neighbor, you know, you could produce for two or three neighbors something, and then have a dairy operation that would use the wet mash to put through the cattle, the dairy cows, because it's a tremendous high protein. One third of that mash or that grain is going to end up into a very high protein mash that could be fed to your dairy cattle, which would increase your butter fat test and the productivity of that cow. You could run the manure into what a manure uh, pump into a digester, which would make gas to, uh, that could produce 30 to 50 percent of the energy to run your still again. Uh, in the hog operations, you can also do the same thing, only you have to be a little more careful in the hogs because of the high fibers content in the mash. Uh, you'd have to mix grain with it, uh, but any animal that has a ruminous type animal, you have no problem whatsoever except you wouldn't want to use it for trying to finish cattle, but for growing calves up to 800 pounds, it's the most excellent feed. 
So if you plan your operation along those lines or think along these lines, what I'm really saying and the reason we're talking to you right now and hope that we'll be able to keep you informed down the line in a good constructive program that is going to make you the envy of the world, that's going to make you energy independent, and that you can produce the food and fiber without the regulatory and dictatorial moves that you're going to see in the 1980s ahead, I'm persuaded. So uh, I don't know, Devon, how much time I've got, because once I get going, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just hardly uh, no stopping. Huh? Huh? All right. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, those of you that may have some questions uh, can contact me, uh, contact the Home Office, and we're going to try to keep you abreast of the places where you can get your information. For example, the University of Nebraska has had a seven-year testing period on mash feed. I'm talking about your brewer's mash or whatever you want to call it. Uh, for seven years on the effect of feeding it to hogs, cattle, dairy cattle, and so forth. And Miss Pooh, who is one of the professors there, done an excellent job, and uh, if you'd write and care of her, I'm sure she would give you, it's spelled P-O-O-S, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. I'd uh, be happy to give you any information you want. Uh, we will uh, gather as much information as we can to give you the addresses, places of where equipment can be gotten, where studies have been made, so that you don't go off there, someone sell you a, a, a blind pig or something down the road, but something that is going to be in your benefit and in your behalf. Thank you very much. Now, as a president looks for one to assist in those areas of responsibility, you know, you have to kind of go to the track record of the individual and decide then if the quality, you want to remember that he is the PR man for the organization, makes many assignments that the president can't make. He goes into hearings, he meets in civic and other business meetings with groups. And so the image that he presents becomes extremely important and his understanding of the programs that we all believe so strongly in. And so as I considered among the membership and those on the board and in state offices and went to the board with a proposal and submitted them the name of Bob Arndt. Bar Bob has been working in the organization for many, many years. Bob comes from the state of Minnesota. He's been on the board prior to this term on the board. He's also been the state president in Minnesota. He has given leadership to that area. And the president has to have someone that he can communicate with, that he has full confidence in. And I submit to you that that gentleman is now your acting vice president. And so as we approach the remainder of this convention, we're going to be talking to you about programs and policies that surround our goals, uh, surround collective bargaining, as we hear reports from this point forward. And so I'd like to introduce to you this afternoon your vice president, who will deliver his message to the delegate body. Bob? Thank you, Devon. Fellow delegates, guests, a quarter of a century ago, a handful of 
men embarked on a mission that undoubtedly they didn't recognize the tremendous impact it was going to have on the largest industry in the world, American agriculture. An industry that, within this nation, is at least two-thirds as large as all of the other combined industries put together. An industry so important that it supplies food and fiber to the people of this country and to a large part of the world, made up of individual, independent, private enterprise people that have produced food and fiber under conditions that often depressed them, destroyed their ability to continue producing, and in many cases left shambles within communities whereby they had to depend on state and federal aid. Those men at that time began a mission that we carried through with, and for that reason we are here today. At that first convention, there were three basic points that were established. Number one, that we would elect our delegates from the county level, from the grassroots. Number two, that the National Farmers Organization was to stay out of business. Number three, that the National Farmers Organization was to secure better farm prices. We came from an era in which the Second World War changed the face of the production of food and fiber. Before the Second World War, labor was the major factor in the production. During the war, we were asked to produce food and fiber for our allies, for ourselves, and for a large part of the world that couldn't get it. New fertilizers were introduced, new herbicides, new technology. And for the first time, we began to realize that we had to begin paying for these things, the new machinery. The, Instead of using horses and feed, we used tractors and gasoline. By the early 1950s, we began to recognize what was known then as a cost-price squeeze. Agriculture was in a change, in a turmoil, and since then, it's never stopped. <coughs> that first convention, the people there knew only one direction to go because that's the direction we always went, Washington. And for the next year and a half to two years, we learned a lesson, a lesson that we never forgot. Because although the industry of this country, the greatest industry, was in a change, Washington was not about to bail it out. At that time, since then or now, and as a result of that lesson was born what we know today, a, a document called the Membership Agreement. It's a document that was put together for the benefit of the family farm system. It is what I've always called the only farm program that will ever work. It was brought into existence a quarter of a century ago, and it's in existence today, and we live by it. It's a document that spells out how to implement collective bargaining, how to set up the structure, and what we do and the steps we take. When that membership agreement was first introduced, it was taken to the country and it caught on. It caught on because the principle was right and just. And for the first time in history, the American farmer had a reason to see a vision to be able to visualize pricing their commodity at the marketplace without going to the federal government, to be able to do something for themselves that no one else was able or could or would do. And out of those first chaotic years was developed a new system, a new method, a system that was developed 
that molded into what we know today as a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system that is beginning to take the place of the old procurement system of the old marketing system that has been existing for 150 years. There were no books to go by. There were no instructions to say these are the steps that we have to take now, step by step. Every step we took and everything we done, we done out of necessity. And as that new system developed, the pages were written. You know they were. They weren't written by scholars and men of great words. They were written out of hard work, frustration, trial and error by you and I. Fear of the unknown. Not knowing what steps to take. Please turn the tape over to side number two.